Doc, you won't believe this, but in 2028, there were no more tunnels used in networking. How in the world did they get the packets to go where they wanted them to go? Well, see, Doc, starting in 2022, companies and governments were so frustrated that none of their orchestrated tunnel solutions could talk to each other. We went from having a truly useful internet to a mess of proprietary overlays. The standards process was effective. The IETF realized that the only remaining purpose of a tunnel was to get a packet to go where it wouldn't go otherwise. By instead identifying the destination as a, of a packet as a word and not as an address that gets rewritten or reused, they solved all of their problems. How did this impact the world? Well, for the first time in decades, things got simpler. Using words to describe tenants and services became a powerful way to express network intent. Once accurately expressed, routers were able to deliver on experiences like never before. So I would say experience-based networking really took hold. Here are some examples. File downloads went faster. Bandwidth requirements at data centers dropped by 30%, saving lots of money on circuits and head-end equipment. And due to an infusion of AI, the cost of network operations were reduced substantially. What happened to SD-WAN? Well, multipath routing remains to this day. Honestly, multipath routing is something routers should have been capable of from the onset of the internet. The missing capabilities required to direct a path for a session or service. A tunnel was the only approach prior to the development of secure vector routing by Juniper Networks. Now every router in the world supports multipath routing. And the SD-WAN use case is now just the routing use case. I want to buy some stock and hold it to 2028. What are the companies that transform networking away from overlays and underlays? I can't give you any investment advice, but Juniper Networks appears to once again be the company that transformed the industry. They did it at the dawn of the internet with the development of ASICs for forwarding, and they did it again 30 years later with the development of secure vector routing. Great Scott, I've never heard of IPv7. IPv6 was codified in the 90s and was still not fully implemented after 30 years. What is IPv7? Well, Doc, sometimes things are held back because of a specific reason. Network addresses so widely used were preventing change. Running two internets, the IPv4 and the IPv6, was the plan for 30 years. And since both worked, it was believed to be only a matter of time but the transition never completed. With Juniper leading the way towards using an addressing system based on words that operated over top of the existing hodgepodge of networks, the addressing issue went away. IPv7 was born as a simple way to subscribe for services by name. DNS was mothballed, and applications were simply requested by name. Routers had routing tables that could turn names into locations. Unexpectedly, the world shifted to a sub-pub model for requesting access to services. Many of the security problems that existed went away. How, how does this work? I can't believe it. Well, it uses metadata cookies. These are inserted into the payload portion of packets and used to communicate network intent to upstream routers. The cool thing, Doc, is that this information makes it through middle boxes, carry grade NATs, load balancers, firewalls, and that can only be read by the intended next hop router. So communicating network intent via cookies changed networking? But all the application guys use cookies today. This doesn't seem so far-fetched, Marty. I wonder why it took so long. Sometimes the future is obvious when you look back on it. Well, after Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk left for other solar systems, the hyperscale big tech company emerged into an even larger behemoth. Every single network server in the world is now run in a micro Google Zone data center. How did this change networking? Well, the shape of the network has always been changing, but in the 20s, the changing shape accelerated. The hyperscalers of that day developed large worldwide networking footprints to connect clients anywhere to servers in their data centers. The concepts of WAN and SD-WAN were challenged. What was needed were easy to use software capabilities that could operate inside the hyperscaler servers to bring back network elegance and control to enterprises. So in the future, corporations will still control their own networks? Yeah, I mean, the digital backbones of companies have become the most important infrastructure they own. They need to control their own networks for security and competitive advantage. They now use AI and ML to assist in operating everything. But, but why did the Democrats and the Republicans go away? Well, they didn't really go away. 
The prevalence of hackers and political operatives and even fake news went completely away when networks had good audit trails. Without misinformation, people started to realize we all share the same goals. We still have political parties, but secure access to reliable information has changed the debate. Doc, probably the biggest surprise is that the giant security problems we had in the early part of the 2020s decade has gone away. But, but Marty, how could this happen? With the advent of router-to-router -router authentication and identif identifying every session in detail with an audit trail defined by an end-to-end -end identifier, scams were rapidly terminated. But probably more important was creating smaller network communication segments that allowed communications only for specific clients and services for a single purpose. They call this hypersegmentation. It's like taking the internet and breaking it into millions of smaller networks, each with a small subset of users and servers. Wow. So what happened to anywhere, to anywhere, anonymous, anybody can send anything to anybody internet? Well, frankly, society, we just couldn't continue to operate that way. Governments were held hostage along with infrastructure companies by attackers. We also couldn't stop using the network. We were really at a breaking point. Did, did SASE help? Well, SASE was the beginning of a set of revolutions in security. The first revolution came when basically no one could trust anyone, also called zero trust. This paved the way to large cloud-based security products. They had to be in the cloud due to the processing requirements, large databases of real-time inf information, and the efficiencies of scale. So it was like the Great Firewall of China? No, not really. Security became much more service specific. Some types of services require very specific security. In fact, separating all of the services into separate networks help prevent losses when, when a breach occurs. What was needed from the network is very simple, specific capabilities to loop in the closest and best security for a specific application or service. How did they stop attackers from always breaking in? I mean, virtually every attack for decades was tied to tricking someone into executing code on a trusted machine. By not trusting any machine, we made a one large step forward. Once access was obtained, exfiltration or attacks can be mounted. To get the executed code onto a machine, URLs are often used or attachments to emails. All that was required was to trick a human that's trusted into clicking on something. The genius of AI and ML came to the forefront of thwarting attackers and hackers. In the famous pandemic of 2021, the way we contained the virus was to segment ourselves as much as possible. We had to identify and track the infected people and quarantine them. We had to develop complex predictive models and we had to find a safe vaccine, vaccine to inoculate everyone. The SASE solutions accomplished all four of these to wipe out fraud, scams, and attacks on the internet. You know, Doc, what I found most astounding is the esteem and reverence that IT professionals had in the future. They had a seat at the executive roundtable, and were involved in every aspect of a business. Turns out, digital infrastructure of companies defined their profit, profitability more than any other single thing. Marty, that's a huge difference from our day. IT managers are often not appreciated. Yeah, you know, AI changed everything. IT guys went from not really knowing how their networks were being used to having a seat at the boardroom. By learning about applications and services, IT leaders became business leaders. Having network intelligence or network knowledge of how digital assets were operating became the key source of competitive advantage. Now everybody wants to talk to the IT guy. Why did it take 50 years to get there? What's preventing us from doing these things now? Well, you know, our networks are multi-layered and today tunnel-based. It's very hard to get useful telemetry. We try to recognize applications on the fly, but this has become harder. Everything is encrypted, and DNS queries are now completely invisible. Google and Facebook succeeded in getting SNI encrypted, which was the last means of identifying applications. So if application creators and owners don't want networks to know what's happening, how, how did this amazing transformation occur? Well, you know, the application guys aren't afraid of their names but they are highly concerned about security, IP addresses, and uh, network infrastructure and so forth. So when changing from using IP addresses to names with IPv7, the application guys started publishing their applications in routing databases. Did, did this make things better? Well, it was perhaps the biggest revolution. So no longer do application owners have to publish lists of IP addresses. 
But the pub sub model for obtaining routes to applications also allowed invitation only access, which greatly improved security. All in, application guys started to cooperate with the network guys. And you know what? They sang Kumbaya together. I was very surprised to learn that Juniper has been added to the Dow Jones Index. You know it replaced Cisco systems? <laughs> Cisco tried to fight progress, but the hyperscalers and application developers really wanted a network that focused on experience. As soon as the application guys discovered that Juniper solutions were experience-based, they became the dominant force in networking. What happened to Cisco? Well, they actually merged with a food services company by the same sounding name, S-Y-S-C-O. Did you ever hear of this? Yeah. yeah. Now the bulk of their revenues are from selling macaroni. I heard Biff got a job at Cisco. I guess I'm not going to warn him. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we, 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 we <laughs> you know, acting is not our long suit, <laughs> but we really appreciate this time. Um, you know, what, what is really serious is how important our networks are and what we can learn from the past because we can't really travel into the future. But if we learn from the past and look at the challenges today, we can start to infer what are the right kinds of solutions. Uh, you know, an example would be if everyone on this webinar looked out their window and could visualize $500 billion of infrastructure, global infrastructure that drives the world's economy, connects us all. And it's made up really of, it would be in three colors, storage, compute, and network. And what's happened is that storage and compute have forever changed. I mean, think about it when you go buy a laptop, it doesn't even have a disk drive anymore. Your storage is in the cloud. And, and compute, you know, VMware and virtualization just changed the, the dynamics and the economics of being able to deploy things like data centers at scale. Same thing's going to happen to networking. And the reason is both storage and compute had general purpose compute separating from the software. And the software could spin free and innovate. And, you know, it was Mark Andreessen that, you know, said maybe 25 years ago, software is going to eat the world. It's just software can innovate so quickly. And so we've worked really hard to separate the routing software from any underlying hardware requirements and really innovate. And we think that networking is going to undergo the same revolution and transformation and have the same kind of business impact and opportunities as storage and compute did. Uh, one of the key things is advancement without technical debt. You know, this notion of putting layers upon layers of complexity to solve your current problem, but just making things more unwieldy. You know, Pat, talk to us a little bit about technical debt. Is that is that what's happening in 2021 and how do we avoid it? Yeah. Yeah, you know, it is my opinion that there, that um, we're accumulating technical debt in our networks at a pretty rapid pace. You know, in, in evidence of that, it's easy to see, is there's like calls right now for standards uh, to be established so that um, tunnel, tunnels that are being orchestrated uh, by one vendor can talk to tunnels being orchestrated by another vendor or, or even another instance of the same vendor. You know, the, the fact that these SD-WAN solutions can't talk to each other is a giant problem. It's also a problem that they're all using slightly different proprietary headers and, and information. You know, we, we the, the way that the network has become so ubiquitous and powerful over, over the ages is because we've all used the same protocols and, and, and subscribed to standards. Standards are very, very important. You know, lately I've seen a bunch of standard proposals being made for people that want the overlay network to actually communicate with and send security events and and uh, with the underlay. So, you you, you know, if, a, if an alarm or a circuit issue or a route issue happens in the underlay, you need to tell the overlay and vice versa. And, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of maddening um, in, in terms of the amount of debt we're accumulating. And, and most recently, I'll give you, you know, another example of how we're overloading existing protocols to the extent that is probably going to drive us uh, to another breaking point. So the, so the DNS subsystem is really used for routing today. The, the DNS system answers the question for every client, not just what is the address of a particular server, but where is the best server for me at this moment in time now? And so that's really a routing that, that really should be the choice of the network and not the choice of of DNS. I mean, DNS is provisioned and populated and takes, you know, 10, 12, 15 minutes for it to be updated. And we're using DNS now with very, very short 
uh, leases, which is how long the information is valid, sometimes measured in seconds. And that's because we want clients to keep coming back to get new information so we can do spread stuff out, do load balancing and, and run our uh, the internet in a, in a different way using DNS as part of our routing solution. You know, so it's very important that um, that we pay attention to uh, these kinds of technologies that are being stretched and uh, hopefully uh, avoid sort of piling on the tech and creating problems that just won't go away and then solving it with yet another another layer. So Andy, um, one of the, you really strike, uh, it's, it sounds so interesting when you talk about innovation and software and w w why is it that you know, big companies oftentimes really struggle with being innovative. You know, well, I mean, the, the truth is innovation requires little companies and big companies, small groups and large groups, because it's not just the idea. It's not it's not a science experiment. It actually is delivering a solution that has impactful, positive business outcomes in a sustained and scalable way. And so what you have is you have little focused or organizations that worship from the altar of disruption and speed, whereas you have larger organizations that are about customer intimacy and business predictability. And so really, it, it's almost like a Texas two-step. And you know what you find are small organizations can really innovate and then need to partner with the larger organizations to become part of a broader context. And you know, that, that's a transition that we as an organization went through about six months ago. You know, so we, Patrick and I, are two of the seven co-founders of 128 Technology. And about six months ago, we found one of the greatest, if not the greatest routing company, the most innovative routing company in the world, where we were cohabitating a very large 10,000 site deployment in retail healthcare. And we realized one plus one really equals four. And so, uh, um, you know, we're able to provide innovation and Juniper is able to provide full stack integration. They're able to provide comprehensive uh, security solutions. They provide ML and AI and cloud, things that we don't have. And so it really is important that you have both of those elements so that the sustainable business outcomes can be affected. Um, you know, sometimes what happens at big companies themselves just try and innovate without any real insight. And it ends up being that we pile on to an existing technology in a way that just isn't so valuable and starts to become unwieldy and maybe even inefficient or cause problems. Pat, do you want to, I know you have one that you want to talk about. Yeah, you know, it, 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 it's really interesting. Like um, it, the way the network works, and I'm not sure how many people know this, but the way it evolved was that uh, it's all based on TCP. And with TCP, you know, in the early days of the network, Andy, I had the same problem in one of my webinars. Don't touch the papers when near your computer. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Yeah, it's okay. You do, or do it very, very carefully. It comes across <laughs> very loud. Um, so the, the interesting part is, is uh, the way the TCP operates is, is it, it never knows how fast the network is. The client and server have no clue. And the server can send out packets way faster than the network can 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 deliver them, which would result in all of those packets being dropped and having to be retransmitted. To prevent this from happening over and over again, every time there's a client server uh, session that gets established, uh, the TCP protocol starts slow and sort of ramps up speed. And when it gets to the point where it's going as fast as the end-to-end -end connection will allow, a, a packet will be dropped. And when that packet's dropped, it signals the server, don't go any faster. And it also signals the client, don't go any faster. So everybody sort of settles down, locks in and understands, oh, this is how fast I can go and, and without dropping packets. And that's how the, the whole internet works. Now the SD-WAN guys, all, uh, several of them, have, tout forward error correction as a way to replace a packet that was dropped in the middle of the network. And what's funny is, is dropping packets is essential to, for the network to work correctly. And so now, the, you know, the, these tunnels, um, because they're aggregate flows and because they're, they're not a single, inside of these tunnels are hundreds, if not thousands of individual flows, because they're such large, what we call elephant flows, they suffer more random early discard than, than if, if all of those sessions had been uh, separate and, and in different flows going through the same routed network. 
first they would be spread out as much and they wouldn't all be impacted by random early discard. But when a discard occurs, it's more likely to happen on a tunnel. So by adding forward air correction, they can recover that packet. But recovering that packet doesn't make sense with the TCP standard. And so it, it and the worst part about it is, is it consumes up to 33% additional bandwidth on top of the uh, on top of the tunnel overhead. So it's an example yet of another sort of um, solution to a problem that we created by solving the problem with more tech. You know, we need to get back to basics of routing packets. If tunnels only purpose is to get a packet to go where it wouldn't go otherwise, we need to fix the way routing works. And that's what 128 technology did. And that's why Juniper acquired us. You know, Andy, um, it, it's, it's really fascinating Because some, you know, the, the businesses really, really need to focus on their digital infrastructure. It's so important to how they run. Maybe you could talk for, you know, I, I'm certainly interested in your views on how important the IT profession and the digital infrastructure of their companies are. And maybe you can comment on that. Yeah, it's funny. You know, in, in the in the present, you know, the little movie clip you and I did, um, we talked about the importance of the IT professional. And uh, it's true that IT, you know, most people don't understand in their organization what the CIO does. It's very hard for them to figure it out. And they tend to look at IT as a cost center. Um, and, and to some extent, there's some truth to that. Uh, we're also seeing that um, we're outsourcing everything to the cloud. You know, we're moving more and more to the cloud. And you tend not to outsource things that are strategic. And so these are these tend to be short. You know, I think that that this is a short term move of what's really going to happen to IT. I think that IT and the IT profession is going to become incredibly strategic to every one of these large corporations, because as they digitally transform, all their engagement and all their experience is going to be controlled through the lens of what IT is able to deliver and secure. And when you think about it, we live in a world even today where the largest taxi cab company in the world doesn't own a single car, and that's Uber. And the largest hotel chain in the world doesn't own a single hotel, and that's Airbnb. And we've seen the last 15 months of the pandemic, we've seen real digital engagement of all of our stakeholders, whether it's employees or partners or customers. And you know what you realize is that the network is where things stop and where things start, and it is critically important. So I do think that the next 10 years, IT is going to become more strategic than it's ever been. Digital transformation is real, and the pandemic has only served to accelerate it. We have a saying around Juniper that uh, experience is the new uptime, and it, and it really is. Because if people have a good experience when they, impact, when they interact with your business, they're going to do it again. And if they have a bad experience, they may go somewhere else. And, and that's really a, a big deal. Um, you know, I'm Pat. I, I guess I could say, Marty. I, I'm kind of, kind of uh, curious. What else changed in 2028? Well, you know, it, it, it's really surprising how the worlds of networking and the worlds of um, the application guys and the and the DevOps guys all sort of merge together into um, a, an amazing world. The application guys really, really have a lot of information that the networking guys would like to have. For example, if a user's failing to log into a service repeatedly, I would think the networking guys would like to know that. Secondly, if an application needs quality uh, qu cost for a particular purpose and the application owner's willing to pay for it, it would be really quite nice if the application could request that securely of the network. Network intent being communicated through the payload portion of packets in the form of metadata uh, in the future could be incredibly powerful way to not only authenticate and secure connectivity between routers, but between routers and servers and between clients and, and, and routed networks. So I, I feel like, you know, this IPv7, we, we all make, we made fun of it in the, in the video, but there really does have to be a new way in the future. There has to be a new way. We can't continue to use IP addresses uh, the way we've been using them and uh, use DNS to try to put some sense to them and to figure out how to run these networks securely it, it, and to express network intent using addresses. It's just not going to work. So I, I am uh, excited uh, when, when I 
when we joined Juniper, I was very excited because many of the people at, in, in Juniper senior uh, uh, engineering areas are very committed to standards. And the question started coming up right away about, well, when are we going to make secure vector routing a standard? When is the metadata going to go through a standardization process? We want to make this stuff open or we will never, that, that's what networking people do. And that was really good news for me. And uh, we're very excited to say that Juniper is committed to making these things a standard. And uh, we really need our, our customers and our, our, our support in, in achieving that. Um, as you know, we, we can't do it our, ourselves. We need we need our big customers to help us. But we're very excited about that. And I do believe that that network is in, networking is in a, 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 a sort of a place where it's going to change fast. Not only Andy because of the things you said, the introduction of software, but also incredible brokenness in how it's working and how we're just layering on more inefficient layers of technology to solve problems that only create more problems and make things harder to understand. And I, I just feel like we're at, a, we're at a breaking point and there's going to be some fantastic innovation. I do believe Juniper's found it in AI and in secure vector routing uh, swirled together. That's my belief. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the thing, you know, Patrick and I are new to Juniper. We've, we've been here for a little over half a year. And so we have fresh eyes. And what's wonderful, first of all, is that the commitment is authentic, that the folks are present. They believe what Patrick's saying, that change is afoot. They need to think differently. They need to partner. They need to assess their value in terms of the impactful business outcomes they can have with their customers slash partners. Um, the other thing is that Juniper very much is in the Goldilocks zone. They're big enough to be global. They're big enough to have a comprehensive solution from full stack at the edge all the way into the cloud with all of the requisite te technologies like ML and AI. But they're small enough that they can all get in a room and they can really talk about the issues. And they're, it, they're, the things they buy, the things they acquire are truly impactful. And um, you know that, that's why I think you're gonna continue to see Juniper lead through this incredible transition of what's going on in this market. So with that, I think we ought to open it up to questions. Really appreciate everyone's time on this webinar. Pat, we're, um, well maybe let me move my papers here without making too much noise and let's look at some of these questions. So there was a question about um, AI features and how they help during the course of time in, in performance of the network. Well, I have to say, um, I, I always prided myself when I was a CTO and top technologist at both Acme Packet and 128 that I, I understood everything about technology. And I can honestly say it's embarrassing, but I knew nothing about AI and ML. And I did not appreciate how it worked. I did not appreciate what it could mean or the power that it, it has. Andy and I used to sit around over, over, over having, we, we share an office because we're, I don't know why, we share an office, which is ridiculous. But uh, we would sit around and have coffee and talk about when cars will drive themselves and when they won't. And um, we would argue, and, literally for hours about the same topic, you know, uh, and of course, uh, neither of us really knows the answer, um, but artificial intelligence is really unique. And, and, and the way I, I, I'm a, I'm a guy that has to see it and touch it to believe it. And when I got to Juniper and I started talking to the data scientists at first, I said, yeah, 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 it's all crap. And then I, I, I saw some of the models they have and I was, blown away. So for example, we struggled, and the best way to, to, to explain it is through example, we struggled and literally uh, had so much difficulty with some bad cables at a large deployment. It was a 10,000 uh, router deployment at a major retail store. And, and there were two routers at every site connected by a two foot long cable, which provided a dog leg and a, a method of communicating between the active and the standby. Uh, because we only sell software at the time, uh, we were an independent company. Uh, the customer had to go out and buy these cables. And so they spec them out as cat six cables and they ordered uh, 10,000 of them. And uh, you know, they, they, they're only two foot long cable. And you know, we wound up having a bunch of problems and uh, in these routers and the, the, and the symptom was that the uh, auto negotiation would fluctuate from 
you know, full speed to, to, to would, it would downshift to, to slower speeds. We wound up seeing some occasional runts or framing errors or, or and, and this was across a large number of, of these different locations. And, you know, the end customer was just fit to be tied. It was, a, they, were, they were excited about the technology, but frustrated that the hardware wasn't working. They thought it was the hardware. We tried swapping the hardware things out. We, we tried everything and, and literally after three or four weeks, we said, well, gee, why don't we swap out the cable? And they didn't believe that the cables could cause such a problem, but we did swap them out at one site and the problem went away. We then realized that by testing the cables uh, and having them at a, t taking them to a test lab that they were insufficient. And as much as 10 or 15% of them were bad, not all of them, but they had no way to know of the 10,000 locations, which uh, locations had the bad cables and which ones didn't. And so they wound up having to replace them all. I got to Juniper and the very first uh, example they showed me on their AIML was a bad cable detection algorithm. And you know, they trained it, they got data from bad cables over, and, the, and the data science guys who don't know anything about networking or bad cables were able to see the data behind it and able to make predictive models of not only uh, cables that were act actively failing, but cables that were likely to fail or, or degrade. And keep in mind, cable performance is tied to lots of things, including temperature and humidity. So I have to say that I fell off my chair when I saw that. And, and, and then I saw some of their other models they're developing. It's truly transformational. I mean, imagine the cost of replacing all those cables because you just don't know. And Andy, uh, right. I always tell you, when I remember when I first saw the internet and I told you this was going to change the world, this AI, ML, and networking is going to change networking. Yeah, I mean, and another example are we we statically engineer and provision pathways on our network for the types of services, and our biases are programmed in there as well. So we may sit there and say, voice needs to go over the MPLS circuit, we'll use the DIA circuit for something else. But you know, a network, a, a learning network is able to look at this and might say, actually, that's not the case. And so if it's able to harvest in real time what's going on, it can start to challenge some of our biases and empirically derive what are the best ways, best paths, best resources for the kinds of services we want. Not to mention that things are, are dynamic. Uh, you know, William has a question here about, you know, header compression as a way to save bandwidth. And before I turn that over to Pat, because we did have an argument early on about header compression um, versus tunnelless architectures and, and what the difference is. There are so many reasons, not just the bandwidth savings for not using tunnels. They're bi-directional, they provide a trap door in the, in the return path, they increase your attack surface area, they make it very difficult to manage individual sessions on a link and dynamically move that. Um, there, there's lots of different reasons, but Pat, maybe you want to briefly talk about um, header compression versus what we're doing. Yeah. So. Uh... I mean, in fact, some people who are really smart say you're still an overlay and you are just compressing headers. And while that's true, uh, we eliminate all the extra data that's sent over and over and over again on every packet by, by using session state to do it. What Andy said is critically important. We also enforce the return pathway, which is what a firewall would do. And, and by keeping the, the flows together into a session, uh, we've, we've been able to provide a lot more analytics and information that would be useful to, to an AI solution or to a, a, a SIEM solution or to a network owner and operator. I mean, we actually don't need to build an, a, a complete overlay data collection and data processing thing to figure out what's going on in our network. We actually know. So uh, all of that's really good. But in the metadata, like we, we talked about um, the metadata being used to compress the tunnel or, or get rid of the tunnel. It also contains routing intent and it's signed. And it's, and it's signed by the first router for the second router. And it also has a time of day in the signature. So what winds up happening is this means that nothing can be replayed. This means that, that if I'm a router talking to another router in the network, Every packet that arrives at that interface is absolutely authenticated from it, it, its source is authenticatable. Also inside this metadata is a session ID that is attached or assigned by the first router that sees the session and, and, and starts the process. And so you can trace things through the network like an audit basis. You can actually even in our products get traces for a particular session through the entire network of routers that support the, the metadata. And so we, it's a it's a it's a transformational way 
to do uh, to express network uh, intent between between routers that works through every firewall, every carrier grade NAT. So it really is a bigger deal than just header compression. And Andy, there was another question here Pat, about. Yeah. yeah, there was a question here yeah, about bad bad actors working their way into IPv7. Um, you know, <laughs> first of all, virtually the entire DNS infrastructure is is not is used in an unencrypted fashion. And I know there's lots of efforts, uh, DNSSEC, and there's uh, lots of efforts to make people stop doing that. Um, but when you think about um, like like Office 365, they publish their addresses online so that firewall administrators can build rules to secure or, or to increase the security between the their their routers or their firewalls at their locations and Microsoft's uh, Office 365 servers. And they update this monthly or whatever. And I think Zoom does the same thing. I think Salesforce does the same. All these basic inf uh, uh, software as a service uh, guys are updating their, their addresses and information. We, we think that and it's all done in a non-standard fashion. Like everyone has their own way of doing it. So most people, it's a document, on an HTML document. And it's got to be hand entered into our, our uh, extended ACLs and our routers manually. And we have to do all the, the, the bitwise math uh, to make to enter this stuff correctly. And it's just really painstakingly painful. And the question is, would application owners uh, submit that information into a registry that is accessible securely? I actually think they would. And I think it would be, you know, the nice thing about subscription models for information, routing information, is that you could publish information in a routing database for only those parties that you want to obtain it. And I know it's complicated, but, you know, LinkedIn, Facebook, these are amazing networks of, of uh, social networks where they, they scale to unbelievable sizes where there's a lot of controls over who can see what and, and who can access what. It doesn't seem far-fetched to me that that couldn't be how the the, the 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 router network operates in the future pat let's see if we can go on to the next one which is you know expand on using words instead of ip addresses yeah so inside this metadata that i talked about we actually put two words in there the one word is the tenant and another, which is basically the identifies the client's network zone or security zone or or and and in in the the, the tenant is structured as a as a dotted domain like address, so it can you can only be in one VLAN. But you know if you use a, a dotted domain name like model, you can actually be in a hierarchical set of, of VLANs, which is essentially uh, which is what we do. So you could be you know an employee, but you could also be a director. You could also be uh, a, 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 you know an executive, and you could uh, have all these different tiers defined by. Uh, like, like a domain address. And that's the tenant side. That, that, that's who's wanting the service. And it's not a 10.0 address or, our, or it's a real textual name. And then the, the service itself is a real textual name, very similar to a, a, a domain name service that you would get in DNS. In fact, it's identical. And so what winds up happening is in this network intent, you know the name of the service the person wants, and you know who the requester is by security zone or by, or, or and, and you trust it because it's been signed by the, the branch router, so you trust it. And it gives you information that you wouldn't have otherwise. So now when you get to the other side of the network, forget, you, you don't even need DNS really. What you need is you have the name of the service, you need to know where that service is. And if that service is on a specific address, you can route, you can NAT, NAT to that address or route straight to that address. So the, the name itself stays in the routing system from beginning to end. Now, invariably, you leave the, the 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 domain of this kind of routed network and wind up in the old world. And in the old world, you are correct. You know, uh, no one's going to be able to read that name out until this kind of networking IPv7 spreads like wildfire. I think I answered the question. I hope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, next one is about DNA. NS and cookies playing a role in SVR between two public IPs? Uh, where's the question? I don't see it here. Oh, hold on. It says, do the DNS and cookies play any role in SVR between two public IPs? Oh. Um, well, you know, the, 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 the public IPs classically that we use today are not really, they're, they're like, um, 
like at your branch office, no one really probably even knows your public address um, unless you are smart enough to figure it out. And when you go to a service, the branch, you know, the public address that's on the edge of the data center that your tunnel's using today, you may not be able to discern as well. I, I think the, um, you know, the, the public addresses in the IPv4 network and the IPv6 network are like transport addresses that the networking world needs to know. They need, I, I need to know how to get to the data center and then once at the edge of the data center, how to get to the servers that have the service I'm looking for. And the name that we're putting in the metadata helps with both. We, we call those public addresses, by the way, at, 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 uh, in our SSR product at Juniper, we call those public addresses waypoints. They're like, if, you're, if you know IPv6 segment routing, they're like, um, the, the segments, they're, they're like the the, 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 in, the instances in, in of fact, the Pat, it, it, Yep, go ahead. And, and Pat, where are you going to go? I want to, let me loop two questions into what you're about to say, because it's important. We had a question about, is this name data routing? And we had a question about how is this different from segment routing? And I remember yeah, okay. around our shop for the last five years, you would talk about, you know, the recipe for doing what we do is taking segment routing, some name data routing and some Lisp and stirring it together. Maybe we want right. to, maybe you want to talk a little bit about that. I think that'll put name data routing yeah. and segment routing into context. Yeah, sure. So name data routing, it does suggest that you you route to named objects on, on the internet and let the network figure out where they are. And in a sense, we do that only, you know, so, we, so I, that's why it's one part name data networking. Um, although name data networking operates on top of an existing network, it requires a complete change in how clients and servers operate. And so we, on the other hand, uh, can bridge the old world to this named world by using our router as a way of applying those kinds of policies. With Lisp, you know, it's, it, it, it has two weak, it has a weakness and it has a strength. The strength, the strength of, uh, of Lisp is that it has a big database of, of things that you need to get to and it gives you an address to get there. So that's similar to how our uh, STEP protocol operates where uh, you know, you, you, it's like DNS, you give it a name and uh, it, instead of it giving you the actual address uh, of, of the service instance, it gives you the waypoint address to get there, but it operates very similar to DNS and, and Lisp. It, it's like, it's like Lisp more than DNS, but it's similar where you, you can look things up to find out an address to send stuff to. And then uh, of course, IPv6 segment routing you know, with IPv6 segment routing, you change the address of the packet to go to the router you want it to go to. In our world, we change the source address and the destination address to be the router addresses to create a pair of routers. So I'm the source router, you're the dest router. I change the address, source address to me, I change the dest address to you. Now I have a pathway between me and you for a session, a singular session, and in return, the, the return path is assumed to be exactly the same. And so the reverse addresses are used in the return path. And we can send 4 billion unique sessions between any two routers using this technique. And so it, that's yeah. all three of them combined. It's like the best of all threes merged together. The weakness with Lisp, of course, is that there's no security. And if you know the the RLOC or the, 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 the secret address that's returned from the, that's the server, you can send packets into a data center with, without, there's no, there's no um, uh, authentication. So we, we've added that. So it's like all three put right. together a, a, into one. And, and, and something that's really important because there is $500 billion of existing infrastructure, you know, over the last 15 or 20 years, people have talked about starting a brand new internet. It's just not gonna happen. We need, we need technology and solutions that innovate in place. And so, you know, if you have our technology at a thin edge at a, a branch site and you have it in a data center or at another branch site, that, that works. We, we can and it will work with regular ordinary routers in between. And we don't need bi-directionality. But when you think about the importance of experience and how that is all session-based, you know, to digital transformation, that does really presuppose that you are, are able to get the bi-directionality so that you're able to make sure that the total experience, not one way or the other, is functioning well. And, and that's really important. 
You know, so Andy, there's been several questions about IPv7. Um, I know, I know. I'm sorry. It, it was a complete farcical notion that there was an IPv7, so there really is no <laughs> IPv7. Um, you know, we were. There are bad well, actors, you know, though. <laughs> well, there are bad actors. But the thing about the, the thing about IPv7 is is you know we have to get away from using these fixed sort of addresses that have no meaning to humans to express network intent. And whether you want to call that IPv7 or you want to call it, uh, a, 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 you know, I don't know what we're going to call it, but I, I think something has to change. We're at a breaking point. And so we made that up out of, as a joke. Um, yeah. You know, there was a question here about, you know, is 128 uh, somehow a zero trust network, zero, tr you know, for ac an access concept between firewalls, no tunnels, only encrypted sessions. Yeah, it is. It is zero trust in many ways. Uh, first of all, every single session is authenticated with its unique signature on every single header, uh, first packet, on every on the metadata it's signed, and then thereafter, every single packet has an HMAC um, checksum on it or an HMAC signature on it. Every single packet that is unique to that particular tenant uh, tenant that is where the traffic is coming from. Uh, so it, it it really is, um, you know, you can't get one packet into this. It's it's as, it's as secure or not as an IPsec tunnel would be. It's it's absolutely as secure as that. Nothing can get in 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 the back way, but it's more secure than a tunnel in the sense of what Andy said earlier. You know, tunnels are like open doors, like it's like a hallway with open doors on both ends that open up pathways and and. To a T, all of our SD-WAN competitors use CIDR block style uh, route enablement uh, through these tunnels. Like they create, they, they, they use these tunnels to create a larger, um, you know, private network that spans from your data center to your branch site. And then you have to go about the business of deciding what should go through that tunnel with either extended ACLs or, or whatever that particular vendor offers as a way to to stop things from going through the tunnel that shouldn't go through the tunnel. You know, because once you open that door, things could sneak in and out. And we don't do that. We treat each session as a unique authenticated admittance uh, in both directions. So if it's going from the data center to the to the branch, uh, it is a unique session that is is separated from the the, the the session going the opposite way from the branch to the data center. So it really is uh, uh, zero trust between these routers. And and when you think about um, segmentation, um, you know what a lot of uh, SD WAN co companies do is they say, well, you need to have a separate tunnel for if you want to have PCI compliance uh, between the branch and the uh, data center. Uh, you don't need that with our solution. We are, in fact, we do quite well in the retail area, especially the largest retail companies on the planet, because we, they use our technique for obtaining PCI compliance. It's very, very secure, and you don't have to have a separate tunnel for to achieve that level of separation. Right, right. A very easy way to think about what we're talking about is if you know Pat and I each have a phone, and I can call Pat, he can answer it, and he can tell me what he sees and perhaps he's a video sensor. We hang up. When Pat picks his phone off hook, he doesn't get dial tone. So by making route paths directional and session stateful, um, you really can provide a lot of security natively. It's almost like a firewall on every single route path. Um, there, there's a question here about um, traffic encryption. You know, Pat, yeah. Pat should elaborate on this because it's really interesting where things are going and how the solution works. Yeah. So some some sessions or some services do need encryption because they're not encrypted it may be a an older sort of sort of technique your company's using that is from 20 years ago and there's no encryption uh what we see in most of the networks we're in is that about 80 to 85 percent of everything that's going between the branch and the data center or the branch and the internet is already encrypted it's already encrypted but and 20 percent is not and of that 20 percent a lot of it is things like dns or N, or ntp you know, old-fashioned protocols, um, and some of them are going through the the, the, the uh, branch to data center connections. And so, what we do is we have this conditional encryption notion, and when we see um, protocols that are not encrypted, 
Uh, we actually can encrypt the payload using AES-256, which is the same cipher that everyone's using with um, with, uh, with an IPsec tunnel. So you, you're essentially uh, got the same uh, cryptographic security, but without necessarily having the overhead of establishing a, a complete tunnel. And we do it on a session by session basis. Session by session basis. So it, it, it's as good as TLS uh, in that sense. It, it's session by session, and it's encryption for each session. We do all the key management between the routers for those protocols that don't have uh, encryption. But we don't re-encrypt everything else. And so if you're using IPsec tunnels, and 80% of your traffic's already encrypted, you're paying a heavy price, both in terms of increased latency, increased bandwidth, and and uh, a much lower performing uh, router because of all the encryption work it's doing. So we do not believe so Pat, you should encrypt a second time. There's there's a question here about for an enterprise currently to make use of of the 128 solution, the Juniper 128 solution, is an on-prem data center, on-prem slash data center the model as opposed to public cloud. So maybe we should talk about where yeah, we are so, with cloud. So, so we, we make software, and, it, and the same exact software, like the exact same uh, release of software, will run at AWS. It'll run on a Dell server. It'll run on a on a Lanner or a Azure. Silicon box. It'll run in Azure. It'll run in uh, 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 Alley Cloud. I mean, it, it's the same exact software, and it runs on high end. And we are in all of those. Things. Yeah, and we and so you don't have to. It, it's almost like, and and you can have one. A sheet of glass to run all of that. You know, one conductor to run all of it. And when we, you know, when when um, Marty was coming back from the future, and he said that the IT guy uh, controlled things that were in the public clouds. Uh, that's how you would do it. Is you you have complete network control of all these routers wherever they're located. So um, another question was about, you know, does 1500 byte packet size make sense in a world of 100 and 400 gig links? And, you know, first of all, a huge part of the gain of our technology and not encapsulating happens with the latency with respect to small packet sizes where interactive communications are involved. I mean, you can see latency cut in half at that point. But it is true that if you try and encapsulate large packets, you can result, you know, it can be packet fragmentation as a result. But Pat, maybe you want to answer the question more broadly yeah. about, about yeah, that. Yeah, it's, it's a very good question because we, on the outset, our assumption was that we'd only save 12 to 15% of the bandwidth when we, before we actually got customers and really dug into it. The assumption was that, oh, you know, this 1500 byte packet, uh, it needs to be act with a small packet. The average would be 750 bytes. You know, uh, VeloCloud uses 131 bytes of, of, of overhead. We don't have any. Therefore, we would save 131 over 750, 12, 14 percent. And that, that was our assumption. And, and we were so surprised at how many small packets are out there in real networks. You know, we did a, a retail establishment and they didn't believe that they were going to save anything. They were using Cisco DMVPN and they weren't even using SD-WAN. It was just DMVPN, which is a, a, a basically uses IPsec tunnels to connect branches to, to uh, the, the data center. And they said, there's no way, you know, you're going to save 15%, no way. So we counted real traffic on a real, we, had, we, we were implemented in a real store for a trial and we measured and compared uh, the traffic before and after the implementation. And we we uh, did it over a two hour period and we saved them 37%. We, and you know, the, the question really comes down to why are there so many small packets? What are their proprietary apps? And why are they sending small packets? And all those, I don't have the answers to all those. I mean, I, all I can say is, is that it was 37% savings and they were just dumbfounded. When they computed, because everything has to go through a security stack and because they uh, have to have data center head end routers and they have to have uh, uh, circuits and everything for this whole network, they were saving five terabytes a day based on that. And, and it really did move the needle. And I, you know, it is surprising. Um, I think everyone should, should measure their own, uh, you know, try to measure their own. We added a feature in our product that actually does it for you. And it tells you, how much you're saving over using a Velo Cloud-like solution, uh, or or uh, uh, you know a solution based on I IPsec tunnels, and it computes it in real time, and you'll see it vary from 12% to go as high as 50%. For certain applications like voice, we we do a lot of voice as well, 
it saves well into the hundred percent range, well into a hundred. It, it, it's amazing. It, it, it's it's like a it cuts your bandwidth in half. So it, it is remarkable, actually. And and before people say it doesn't matter, they really need to start looking at their costs of their of all their head end routing equipment and circuits. Right. And and you know a derivative of that is that you know more and more people are using wireless as a backup. Um, to augment their wireline connectivity. And if you need to move a session that's not performing onto a wireless link and you depend upon tunnels, you're either going to drop the session because the tunnel convergence time is going to be longer than what the session timer will allow, or you're going to keep the session, you're going to keep the tunnel alive and incur a pretty onerous expense in terms of heartbeat while you're just waiting to receive something that may or may not um, happen. So you know, not requiring tunnels means that you can just move over to wireless link. You you can move the session, it runs, and there's no convergence time. There's no uh, bandwidth penalty in terms of a heartbeat. There was, I think John had a question as it related to, does this replace BGP? And that's a good question. Yeah, it is a good question. The, the, no, it, it, it doesn't. In fact, our although we didn't explicitly talk about it in our in this presentation, our router has to support OSPF, BGP, and all the different routing protocols that are in use today because there's nothing wrong with layer three. Layer three works fine. You know, the issue really is when networks talk to each other. It's like I have an RFC 1918 private network uh, running 10.0 addresses, and I need to talk to AWS that has another 10.0 address space. And our approach to this over the last three decades has been, let's make a WAN and normalize all this addressing so everything can talk to everything. And then we'll put in extended ACLs to prevent everything from talking to everything. And then, you know, <laughs> let's hope the company doesn't divest anything or buy anything or, or change anything because, oh my God, it, it, it just becomes so fricking brittle. And so we said, the problem is you can't go between networks. It's an inter-networking problem we have. It's not a networking problem. It's how these networks, where these networks meet that BGP doesn't go. You can't connect, you know, BGP won't allow you to connect a private network over a public network to a private network. It doesn't permit that. That's the focus of what uh, we're trying to do here, which is create an internetwork that works. So something you said uh, sparked Ramesh uh, to have an observation saying, so I suppose this is an overlay then. Yes, it, it, it is an overlay technically. We get into this dispute of, is it an overlay or an underlay? It, it is a logical overlay for sure. It just isn't tunnel based. It signals with metadata in, in the first packets of sessions. And um, not in every session like IPv6 segment routing, but just in the first packet. Right, right. Well, Patrick, I, you know, I, I guess I'd like to just, you know, end by saying thank you to everyone that came. Um, yep. You know, we have lots of materials. We run, um, you know, lots of webinars, seminars. Um, we're distributed all over the world. Come check us out. We, we really feel like we can have a dramatic income on your digital transformation journey that will have positive business outcomes for your enterprise or your organization. And, you um, you know, we're, we're here for you. So I hope this is the beginning of a relationship or an extension of, a, of an existing relationship. Pat, is there anything you want to end with? Yeah, I'm on LinkedIn. If anybody wants to have a one-on-one -on -one about the technology, I, I just love it. So give, give, reach out to me on LinkedIn. Excellent. Thank you.